everyone. Uh, just doing a quick video um, guide how to use UpCloud, uh, cloud management service, to spin up a box quickly, uh, go and put a web administration uh, control panel in there so you can uh, make it easier to manage your server rather than having to do everything via the terminal and bash command just so that kind of makes your life easier to spin up databases, DNS entries, uh, all that kind of thing. Um, and lastly, we're just going to go ahead and make a WordPress site. Um, basically, first of all, just going to align it to the IP of the server, and then finally, um, point a domain name to that server and pretty much realize a full website spun up on an UpCloud instance. Um, so for, uh, just before I begin, obviously, um, UpCloud is one of the many... Um, cloud server providers um, so the big ones in the game obviously are Amazon Web Services uh, we've got DigitalOcean we've got Google Cloud Microsoft Azure even even up and coming Alibaba Cloud although I've done a quick review on some of the feedback on the web out there and a lot of people aren't really happy with the customer service and the complexity of the control panel and yeah that's probably where I don't really want to touch it right now uh, so what we've come across is um, UpCloud, and they're very much like Linode, where they're pretty much giving you the bare bones of it, and you can manage it yourself. But what I really like about um, UpCloud is the very clean interface, and also uh, the customer support. That is a really big um, tick in the box for me. Uh, I've used Amazon Web Services, and it's great. There's so many tools, but it's really confusing to get your way around there. You have to read so many tutorials, watch so many videos and learn so much to get around there and when you have to set up Elastic Beanstalk and instances and EC2s and, and things like that it starts to become pretty complex just to spin up a simple website or a WordPress instance. Uh, Bitnami has made it easier with like a one-click install but it's still um, a bit clunky for me um, and you know the customer support is pretty much non-existent you just gotta kinda figure it out yourself so um, there's that and also the pricing is per hour like many of the cloud server providers but at least with UpCloud you put the money up in a prepaid account and you can watch it being used as you go and then you can top up it's not like a bill that you get afterwards so you can see kind of a bit more like Amazon does let you manage it minute by hour by hour or day by day but at least um, you don't get direct debited by <laughs> UpCloud unless you want to of course so Basically, a little short intro on them. Uh, they're a Finnish startup uh, based in Helsinki, and they've entered the game a bit later on. Um, and they're a bit of an upstart in the community. And as a lot of the big players have said, you can't really match us unless you're throwing billions of dollars in this area. And um, they're kind of proving that that's not so much true. Uh, they've already got, I think, about eight cloud server instances around the world, mostly um, concentrated in Europe. Um, there's a few in America and obviously one in Singapore, but um, they're making some pretty bold claims with the speed of their servers um, in their website. Even here you can see they're offering superior cloud hosting and they're the world's fastest cloud apparently. Um, one key difference is they're using, a uh, instead of using solid state drives, they're using a technology known as Maxi Ops. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but that's um, some high-tech stuff there if you want to get into it. I'm not sure. I've still got to go in there and do some checks. I mean, using things like page speed and um, GT metrics and all those kinds of things are a bit inconclusive because there's so many variables and gateways and ways they're testing the speeds that it's not comparing apples with apples. You've really got to go in there and benchmark. And a tool I've come across is, uh, I think it's called geek bench or bench geek um, and that's kind of removing a lot of those kind of variables and making it more of a accurate comparison um, but like I get said before the customer support with these guys is great you can chop uh, you can hop on live chat and ask a question and get pretty much um, instant feedback it's, it's really good or instant support um, as again you're not going to really have um, kind of all that uh, management like with a managed server. I've, I've come across from shared hosting and VPS hosting like from SiteGround or Bluehost uh, HostGator and it's great to have those guys kind of managing it for you and make sure that it's patched up to date and things are happening properly although sometimes the servers just do go down although not that likely. Um, with 
obviously managing your own cloud instances, the um, responsibility is on you as the administrator to do that, but the cost savings are much greater and the flexibility that you get is better as well. One of the things that you don't get with UpCloud and many of these providers is cPanel. I mean, cPanel is a commercial um, web control panel and it comes with a lot of the hosting companies, but um, it doesn't come with these guys because it actually you know, is an extra cost. And if you want, you can do it yourself. But like I said before, I can actually, I'm going to go through and show you how to install a Vesta IP, uh, sorry, Vesta CP, which is a open source one. And there's a few other open source ones like Virtual Min, Web Min, um, Agenti, I think, uh, also CentOS Web Control Panel as well. Um, but I've used them all a bit, and I think the uh, Vesta CP is the most kind of clean interface with, it, and you don't get confused in there, and it really is a bit of a balance between, you know, the shell command and the uh, GUI interface as well to make it easier for you. But I won't uh, keep talking more about it. What I'll do is I'm just going to log into the UpCloud interface, and I've got a, an account with these guys already, so what we're going to do is just quickly go through the steps to spin up an instance. I mean, the great thing is as soon as you log in, we're in the control panel, your notifications are on, um, you can see your servers straight up. So I've spun this up before to test out a virtual min admin panel, um, and it's sitting there, so we're just going to spin up a new instance really quickly. So there before we've got where you want to locate it. So obviously if your customers are in Germany, you're going to pick that particular server. If you're in the USA, you're going to pick that one as well. I'm in uh, Bangkok, so I'm going to pick Singapore because that's the closest to me. Um, then we get to choose what kind of plan we want. So you can have as many servers as you want. This is just going to add on your balance. So you have a balance of 100 US dollars in there. All these servers you're adding on is just going to you know, deduct daily from that account. Um, so I'm just going to spin up an instance like this and you can see they're quite generous with the amount of resources they give you. So if you went up to $20 a month, you could probably share several um, websites on the same server by the DNS entries and whatnot um, and basically economize all your costs there. Um, but if you want to, you can have dedicated boxes for websites as well, especially with websites that get more, you know, more high volume traffic and things like that. Um, so I'm just going to leave everything as default and you've got the option here to pick your server type. So you've got Linux based servers and you've also got the Windows server if that's your thing. Um, if you're operating and you need to develop applications for Windows Server, you can spin up one of those. But we're just going to pick Ubuntu, the latest default one, the Bionic Beaver. Um, you can change, obviously, the older versions if that's your thing, because I know a lot of people prefer the um, previous uh, Ubuntu 16 version. Um, so we're going to go with Bionic, because I see it's pretty good right now. The only things I've heard about is the GUI, which um, we're not really going to be getting into um, in this area at all, it's only going to be accessing the server via terminal. Um, if you've already previously set up SSH keys on the server and on your private uh, private public pair of keys, you can actually hook them up straight away, so that's pretty handy. Um, lastly, you can also initiate scripts, like a bash stall script, so you could have it uh, customize the server instance on the fly, rather than you having to go in and add all the things, as we're going to go through in this video anyway. Um, so lastly, you've got the host name here. We're just going to keep it as the default one over here. So we're going to keep that instance. Um, and then I'm just going to say uh, server Ubuntu 18 for testing. So, you know, you put whatever you want in there. So we're just going to deploy that. And um, this takes several minutes to go ahead and deploy. And at the end of it, it will email you the root password and it will also show it to you in the notifications area here. So these are some previous ones that I've spun up here and that's the password for them. And I've already deleted these instances. So yeah, don't bother trying to get in there with my IPs because it's just doesn't exist. And at the end of this video, I'm going to be removing the one I create as well. So you can see it going through and thinking about it and processing all the resources to spin up a, a virtual box there. Um, and we're just going to pause the video and get back into it when that uh, server is ready to go. So you can see it uh, comes up with um, yellow and it uh, pretty much says, you know, under maintenance. And when it's green, it means it's ready. Now that that's happened, um, it just takes, you know, five to ten minutes to spin up the box depending on where you are and what your speeds are like and stuff like that. Maybe if I was closer to Singapore, it might be faster. Not sure, but anyway, it's pretty good. You can make a cup of coffee whilst it's doing it. Once it's there, you get a notification telling you what the root 
password is and you'll also get an email as well to your account so um, you don't have to copy and paste the code anywhere it's already kind of kept for you um, so what we need to do is just uh, SSH in just to confirm we can get into the box so let's copy that one down at the bottom so we're going to go SSH root at and now copy and paste the correct IP address and I already went in before and it actually cleared all that um, uh, information about being the first time I've logged into the server. So it's not going to ask again, but the first time it will ask you for the RSA single fingerprint. Uh, so now I'm just going to go ahead and get that password. Copy and paste it in there. It's much easier to copy and paste and type yourself because you don't get to see your password in the terminal, obviously. Uh, there you go. So that comes up. It's telling you how much memory, uh, sorry, it's using and some of the usage. So it's using, you know, 6.7% of the uh, 25 gigabytes allocated to the server. So that's really the Ubuntu package. I think it's around 4 gigabyte or so. If you get an older version of Ubuntu, you might be able to save on the storage bit. Um, it's kind of negligible, really, because you get a lot of space anyway. And usually you get told about new packages coming up. Um, and I'm just going to show you after we log in here how to set up um, a little uh, software application called Apticron. Um, and it'll basically tell you when new Ubuntu patches and packages are coming available. And it's a really good idea to try and keep it updated as much as you can for security purposes, along with your firewalls and setting up SSH key pairs. There's so many kind of layers of security you should really be looking at when you're setting up your own cloud servers because no one else is going to do it for you. Um, so and we're going to go in and um, basically just do a quick um, apt get update. You hardly need to but it's just really out of habit just to make sure everything's kind of up to date and all the packages are there. That's pretty much something you should do after you install every piece of software really. Um, Let's so say you should do a git pull before working on any git branch, uh, kind of like that. So um, now what we're going to do is do apt get install apticron. So it's going to ask us about space, which is really tiny. And we go ahead and it's basically installing that. And so what we're doing it is, I think you can leave it as it is, um, it's an internet site, so I'm just going to leave it like that. You could do it on local if you work in a local environment, but it's pretty much set up to do all the things. That's the system mail name, so that's the domain, so it's already recognized it for us. Let's go with OK. So that's going to set it up. Actually, previously when I've installed it, it hasn't come up with that notice, but maybe they've changed the package and how it works, so it can be set up for different environments and different configurations. So what we need to do after this is go ahead and edit the um, configuration file and put our email address in there because without it, it won't actually let us know about new package updates. So what it does is just email you every time they come available and say, hey, we've got some new packages, you should really go look at updating them. And there's a wealth of resources online that will show you how to basically uh, update the Ubuntu packages. Um, so... Once this installs, right now, we're going to go in and do uh, we don't go Vim. That's a nice text editor. You could use the uh, Nano text editor if you wanted to, but Vim one's like heaps better because of the um, it's got all the um, colors in it. Actually, it's a bit more better, a bit more smarter. Set up pretty well, actually, by default. Just do a tab just to do it like that. So that's where we find the Apticron configuration file. So as you can see, Vim's good because it kind of color codes everything, whereas um, the cat command doesn't really. So you get to know what's commented out and what's what here. So um, what we do is we just go into the uh, email in there and just hit the I key for inserting and editing. And now I'm just going to put my email address in there, or a email address in there. So escape that now and do shift and make it a colon and an X just to save an X in the file. So that's all you really need to do to set up Apticron. Now what that's going to do is regularly run a cron job and check for patches and package updates for Ubuntu. 
So that's all set for you, so you don't have to worry about always doing um, manual searches for it. You'll know when they come, basically.